Jose, thanks so much for coming. I'm so glad to talk to you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you are um, in the middle of, of what I think is a, is a really important piece of writing, which is your um, writing on science funding and the Fund People or Projects uh, series. So you've done five so far, is that right? Yeah, there are five of them now. Do you think there'll be more? Um, there might be maybe one or two more. There are, there are some additional questions um, uh, that, that I want to answer. There's, of course, the, the question is, uh, where do where does this end? Should this become actually the funding science project or yes, fund people not projects? It's been increasing in a scope since I started. So how has it been? Um, well, okay, so I guess I'll go back to it. Uh, where, um, right now, where do you stand on the spectrum of, wow, everything's fine, this is all working on one hand or the other hand, which is abolish peer review. We need to start over from scratch. <laughs> where do you where do you fall on that uh, spectrum? Um, yeah, um, I think that lately I've been answering to, to these kinds of questions with, with the probably the most annoying answer that one, one can give, which is it depends. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the reason being that uh, I do think that some things of science are in, to, to some extent broken and can be improved. But in parallel to that, I also think that the, the, the robustness of the evidence for, for those uh, comments, it's also not super strong. That is that uh, repeatedly when going into this literature, uh, meta science in general, in particular uh, science funding, um, um, this, um, I found it that the evidence itself is not that strong. Uh, also researchers themselves are also calling repeatedly for ex more experiments that, that, that we don't know, we don't have enough clean experiments um, for uh, funding science. And so, for example, I do think that uh, in some areas, for example, in physics, for example, I do see a strong case for, for a more funding people uh, approach, um, or maybe I could perhaps explain what funding people means uh, in context, just for, just for some introduction. Um, and then we can maybe go back into, into where we want to fund people or projects. So yeah. fund people or projects, the, these days, uh, uh, the fund people approach tends to be associated with the Harahish Medical Institute uh, uh, that basically in, and and this, this, and this kind of uh, discourse is typically framed as an opposition between the typical way in which science is funded. This is the, in the NIH has this, uh, um, their typical funding vehicle is a so-called R01 grant. And the idea here is that you're, you have, as a scientist, you say, I'm going to be working on this, uh, which is a more or less detailed grant proposal, which the suppressing they take a very, very long time to write. In some cases, scientists may be writing, uh, spending famously almost half of, half of their time is up, up, applying for grants. Mm -hmm. um, so they have this very detailed grant proposal that, that are very specific, and then they get funding to do that. Now, in practice, they don't necessarily do exactly that. They may actually do other things on the side that they actually want to do, but, but in practice, they, that's how it's supposed to work. Uh, in contrast to that approach, they, the, the HHMI, the, uh, the Har Huge Medical Institute, what they do is instead to do more personal one-on-one -on -one interviews with people to start to select um, scientists. So you can apply for, a, for an HHMI uh, um, investigator uh, position. And in this case, they, they actually hire you as scientist. It's not a, like a grant. Um, and in that case, you, you submit them a more or less uh, broad, um, not necessarily vague, but more or less broad overarching research program, uh, uh, which, can, which can involve many questions. And you can actually change the, the, the kind of questions you are interested in uh, over time. Uh, funding also around until you for seven years. So in practice, you have maybe 14 years of, of continued HHMI funding, which means that you could potentially think more longer term as to um, what you want to do. So um, this funding modality was not pioneered by HHMI, it was pioneered perhaps by the Rockefeller Foundation prior to the to Second World War. At least, uh, they, um, they thought that instead of being impersonal and just like you get a bunch of proposals, these are like just less names, kind of piece of paper, and you just read them and then you fund based on that. Instead, they would actually. Uh, meet the scientists, even have dinner with them, uh, get them to a restaurant, get, get to know them as, as a person, as a human being, and say, is this person someone I will trust to do great work, regardless of what they're going to be doing? Um, mm -hmm. On an extreme, uh, or perhaps an even more extreme version of this might be uh, Don Braven's uh, venture research program uh, while he was at, at BP, British Petroleum, um, where he would uh, have a strong belief that if you're a great scientist, uh, no matter, uh, it shouldn't like be as a funder, you should not care about the, the area or the specific project, you should just fund and support these great scientists into whatever endeavor they may be interested in. Um, and, in and so he frames it as that um, um, high, high reward research doesn't imply high risk research. Uh, uh, to be, typically you have like, like low risk, low risk, uh, or can say that it's safe, uh, 
I'm not principled to say that there's also high risk, high reward research, but Braven says that if you find these very uh, excellent and really good scientists for longer, maybe you, uh, you, will not know, you will not know what you're getting. In that sense, it's high risk, but you know that you're probably getting something good. In the, so in that sense, it's, it's, uh, it's low risk, in, so hence low risk, high reward um, in, in, in that case. I love that. So the, the funding people versus projects question is kind of how a lot of people get pulled into this discussion. And I think what's so great about your series is that's the question that you started with. Um, but what's interesting to me is once people start really going down that um, rabbit hole of like, well, what are we funding? They yeah. like the best, the best um, works on this, I think are, is your series. I think Paula Stefan's work, um, uh, you know, how economics shape science is also really good. And that Pierre Zoulet's uh, papers are really good too. And what's interesting to me is all of you start to start to land on a really similar, um, land at a really similar place, which is we should have a better science of science funding. We need to, we need to understand this more. And then secondly, we need to be thinking about this uh, from a portfolio perspective and and, divert, and involving ideas of diversification. Um, so that I think is really interesting that all three of you kind of start to land at the, at the same place. Um, you know, my question is, if you had to make a list of the scientific assets that we could be diversifying into, what's like a, what's like a, a list of possible um, things like people versus projects is one, but what else would you put on that list? Yeah, I mean, there are various dimensions that you could use to allocate funding. So, um, and, and, and actually a people's research project itself, that that dimension is actually typically uh, when observed in real life, it usually comes wrapped or, or, uh, are correlated with other things. For example, you could fund for shorter or for longer periods. Um, for example, um, as it happens, uh, HHMI and uh, the NIH uh, Directors uh, Pioneer Award, they usually fund for longer than they usually grant. Um, this NIH program being also a fund people on projects kind of uh, program. But it, it doesn't have to be like that. So in theory, you could, you could imagine that you could, you could fund projects for longer, or you could fund people for shorter. Uh, likewise, you could fund um, uh, with more money or with less money, that there is there's there's also some uh, some discussion that I go into in the series of blog posts as to um, if you are going to give a grant to someone, how much money should there be in that grant? Should there be a limit to how much money an individual lab or researcher uh, should get? Um, and likewise, there is also the um, allocation mechanism. So um, mm -hmm. even if we want to fund people or projects, we can we can say okay, we're going to to fund someone at random uh, with a lottery, we're going to maybe have interviews, like a very personal high touch kind of process. We can have some kind of algorithmic decision-making thing based on, on citations, like it's saying someone looks promising based on bibliometrics, we can give them an award. Um, and all of these things can be combined in, in different ways, uh, which, uh, but the, the interesting thing is that they typically come uh, wrapped in, in certain ways, but like partly because if, if you want to do like a high touch approach, if you want to, uh, um, fund someone for very long, or if you want to get really to know that person, if you're doing it at scale uh, right now, that would not be workable. You have to be spending lots of time in interviewing literally the entire uh, scientific system. Um, um, but it might be possible to still um, do in, or introduce some of these uh, or some variation across all these different axes with, with other uh, funding formats. Um, so for example, I have this um, in one of my uh, articles, I think it was article number uh, four, I introduced uh, an answer to, 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 to the question that would be if I had like to structure a funding system, what that would look like. Um, and so I chose, uh, and again, this is to some extent, and, 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 and given the lack of uh, strong evidence as we discussed before, to some extent, this is not like 100% uh, supported by evidence. It's something that I would like to see tried and, and, and importantly quantified to see what this does to the kind of science that gets done. So I would, have, I would split funding in three different parts. I would have the part A, which I dub the HHMI light version. So this would be 85% of the funding. And this would be allocated in a, again, in an HHMI way. So we, we've had fund this for five years, proposed that would be relatively short. Uh, so it would be for a broad research idea, not for something extremely specific. And, and also unlike with the NIH, the reviewers for this program would be asked to um, put a proposal, uh, maybe after a quick scheme into, into this thing is great. It should be funded no matter what. This is completely 100% like Nobel Prize material. Like, yes, this is definitely good. Second basket would be 
this is not really going anywhere like bad research. And then the third one is, is kind of maybe, kind of uh, perhaps it, it may be interesting. So each reviewer will only have a limited number of must fund uh, kind of uh, uh, like tickets. So, so you only get, let, let's say a number of projects projects that get, that get or researchers rather that get funded for sure. And, and everyone else would go into, into a lottery and then you, you have some funding uh, allocation at random. Um, if uh, this would be for like a baseline level of support, the, um, the typical R01 grant at NIH runs for like for $400,000 for like five years. Um, you could, as a scientist, request more funding if you need it, but then uh, the more funding you request, you should probably get more scrutiny and more justification as to where the money is going. Um, a lot of research is not very expensive. So in principle, some research, especially more on the theoretical or computational side can be uh, as expensive as someone's time, whereas other research can be uh, more uh, intensive in resources. But for that latter kind of kind of project, there is part uh, part C of uh, this uh, part A, part C. Let's do part B uh, at the end. So part C of this uh, funding mechanism would be the pseudo ARPA, uh, which would be ten percent of the funding, and this would be targeted more towards projects projects that require um, some level of, of uh, high funding and coordination that are difficult to find in in the single grant model. So here we would be again we would have like program program managers that would look at different fields and say. Um, oh, like, uh, let's say if, if the field is um, immunotherapy, they could say, oh, uh, the data in this particular subfield is not very really clear. It would be very useful if we if we were able to like have a, like a lar large sample uh, size, uh, like gold standard data set to really ground truth uh, this whole area so that the scientists can actually uh, have definitive answers to, to this or, or, or that question. Or they could say, well, like the this area, let's say the area around brain computer interfaces looks like there's lots, lots of interesting things happening here and there. If someone put them together, we could have some some uh, interesting uh, commercially applicable product, um, it's, which would effectively like like Neuralink. So Neuralink could have been uh, a result of this kind of like seed ARPA project. And like and, and as in DARPA, saying uh, you had Ben Reinhardt here, uh, it would be have the the, the the success formula for ARPA. It requires lots of discretion to pro, uh, to program managers. Um, and so program managers should be able to, to choose what they want to work on and, and should be empowered to, to give more funding or cut funding from a given project. Um, this, this part of this funding program should be should work um, on a, should be driven by APM. So that, that is that this is not something that scientists apply for. Um, mm -hmm. And that they should be focused explicitly on things that they think that cannot happen in any other way. So they should not be funding a smaller, a smaller studies. And lastly, the, what I call Part B, which is a smaller one, this would be 5% uh, of the funding of this entity will be the, the, the pseudo Planck Club. This is what, what Don Brain would say. This kind of scientists that, that really require a very, very long time to show results that it's difficult to judge from their early work, uh, if it's going to be promising or not. And this will be funding for um, 20 years. That this will be that they get funding for 10 years to work on something. After 10 years, they get some evaluation, but in the same sense that they judge mice for seven years, but unless you really are doing very badly, you get another seven years here is 10 years plus another uh 10 years um you can only get this once this kind of very super long-term funding once um and the the committee that that selects uh these uh, the members of this plan club uh would be instructed to find people that they would think will be novel worthy people like people that are that particularly excellent people that are at the that are either extremely promising and young or that are or that on the other hand, they're already, uh, even if older, uh, is still promising. Uh, perhaps if they want to, to move into a different field, uh, for example, uh, Don Braven uh, funded uh, someone that, that already got an annual prize, but wanted to move into a different, to a different field and was having trouble switching careers and, and he supported uh, that. And so, and so this, uh, this funding structure uh, would, uh, would be supporting that kind of uh, both uh, young and promising, but also old and, and wanted to do something weird and, and new. You know what I love about you is, is you, this, is a lot of people have come to this point of like, okay, we should diversify and we should have a portfolio, but you're the only one who actually has the guts to say what you think that portfolio diversification um, should actually be. So I really respect that. I also um, hmm. kind of have heard your arguments about why we should be um, spending more in the life sciences and biology. Uh, and, I, and I like those arguments as well. So I appreciate that you're willing to put yourself out on the line um, with, your, with your thoughts there. And my thinking, you know, along those lines, one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, if we think about financial markets, there's, mm. there's entrepreneurs and, and business operators, and we don't always, like we don't expect them also to be the best investors, right? There's a class of people 
who right. specialize and compete on allocating capital, and they they're able to um, you know gain status and and financial rewards hmm. um, from their ability just to allocate capital. And science doesn't have that um, unless I'm unless I'm mistaken. Um, you know, there's program officers and things like that, but oftentimes those are just scientists. And there's not, um, I think there's not enough credit yeah. given to those folks. So what do you, what do you think about the idea of, of celebrating um, uh, good scientific administrators? Yeah, I, I guess but the issue there tends to be that that even from the beginnings of, of science, there was this, this idea that, that science is better left to the scientists and that only scientists can understand what goes on in their field. So we end up with a situation where it is only your peers that can, that can uh, judge you at the end of the day. Now uh, that, um, isn't necessarily true as seen as an, as in, uh, if you're a scientist in one area, you can potentially, after some training, you could maybe have get some taste for what good research looks like in a different field. Uh, Don Raven, for example, he himself was a chemist, but he was uh, seemingly able to judge research in, in other areas uh, that were not his own. Um, and similarly, the, the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and, 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 and elsewhere and HMI, they, they get an idea for what, what's, what a good research looks like and what they Talk like and what and how precise are they in, in what they um, what they say? Maybe how enthusi enthusiastic are they about, about what they are doing to see if they really understand the problems uh, in, in their given space? Um, um, so that that's that's the thing. The the um, in, in one of the posts that I wrote, um, I think one of the initial ones actually the the thing that prompted this whole series of articles was my review of Don Braven's book, uh, Scientific Freedom, where he suggested that in some cases we want to replace. Uh, Peer review uh, by, by peers, by by review by and that this is what it, it's funny by in this case Braven review. In this case, he was he himself and with without without any any supervision, any any adult supervision or any uh, sure th there was in theory a, 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 a committee at BP that uh, was kind of like um, pre-reviewing his decision, but but largely he was uh, he was able to do to fund whoever he wanted. Um, so then the question becomes: How do we choose our own Bravens? How do we choose, uh, or how do we pick talent for to, for our administering uh, grants? That that is an interesting and, and unsolved question. I I, I kind of uh, wonder that maybe we want to like randomize this thing. Maybe we want to, um, let's say, uh, to bring it back to the experiment side. Maybe we want to take let's say a pool of funding, split it into like three or four parts, and then a part one you give it to. Uh, let's say like George Church and Ed Boyden are like very big names in biology. Second part, you give it to, to a bunch of like uh, random internet people uh, like, like us, and then we, we get to <laughs> design the, the, that that funding. Part three, uh, you could also have some system where you you get you, you give researchers uh, like a bunch of like vouchers or coupons, and they kind of vote vote for each other, and whoever gets more more votes, then the funding gets allocated as a proportion of that. You could have some like prediction market mechanism as well, whereby. Um, prediction of future citations is what actually ends up allocating funding. Um, it's similar to the proposal for like nominal and GDP targeting in economics, where you use prediction markets to target inflation. Um, um, but yeah, uh, this is like this is definitely uh, a very fun and interesting area where there's like there are lots of uh, mechanisms that have been proposed for allocating funding, uh, and I really wish to see uh, more more of them tried in the real world. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I I've been thinking that as well. And, and I sent you that post I had written about um, just start even starting small, right? Like we can, we can, we can test these out on smaller scales. And that would be even, even that would be an interesting uh, set of data to have. Yeah. And, and then actually on, on the smaller scale, there's also, there's an interesting trend in science right now, which is that, that, uh, well, if you want to maintain your grant, you have to, well, grants to begin with are, are quite big. So you need to do big experiments kind of to some extent mm -hmm. by design. And so suppose that everything you want to see is um, if um, if a given protein has one part, maybe it's some very simple experiment that that it can open up a, a bigger like avenue of research. Um, and if that's the all you want to do, then it's like, where do you you kind of have to do it on the side in the current model? You have to you have to get a grant to get data for the next grant. Um, but maybe it could be that that these smaller targeted grants could help just like uh, uh, do, do like a, like a quick sanity check of a, of a simple idea and then use that to like build a larger grant proposal. Yeah, so um, you know, jumping back a little bit to the um, this idea of a portfolio and diversification, um, what are some ideas you have around alternative assets? Like, what are some imaginary new assets that, like, scientific assets that we could create uh, that you know scientists could compete for? Because, in my opinion, right now, you know, no matter how we distribute the funding, the incentive is still for them to create papers like Paula 
you know, Stefan outlines is like the papers mm -hmm. are going to drive the career promotion and that's going to drive, um, you know, you know, their, their, their motivation and their work. I think one of the alternative um, assets might, you could say, is this kind of this trend of scientists also having startups, right? Like creating mm. uh, companies. So that's an alternative kind of asset. Um, is there anything else that kind of jumps to mind there? I mean, th there are assets, if, there are two meanings here. One might be uh, I think reform that can change the way in which science gets done or the kind of science that gets done. And then there's assets in the sense of like institutional or financial vehicles through which, uh, or that could be used to, uh, to, to further uh, um, research. Um, on the latter, for example, you could imagine some kind of like that's like that. this is something I was uh, thinking about the other day. Um, imagine that there were some kind of like DARPA funds where, where, you, where you can like donate money in, a, in, a, in an extremely generous and tax advantage way um, that then would go into into doing research um, uh, of a, like of a like DARPA kind. As, as, in, as in, suppose you had you had this uh, this company that does well does research, and then the company itself could uh, spin off uh, startups into the world based on the research it itself it's uh, it's doing. Uh, sure, maybe the research in that case wouldn't be published immediately. It would be published uh, some sometime later, so that the startup has some uh, first mover, mover advantage. But you could have this you could have this structure of a nonprofit that gets uh, that you could donate into a tax uh, without uh, with, with a tax credit, but that also at the same time is getting all this money back from from its investments. Um, this is something that uh, it seems like it's doable under the 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 IRS uh, tax code in in the United States, and and that to some extent it was actually done in in the past. Uh, so. Uh, uh, funnily enough, this is like an inversion of the usual model. So in the usual model, you have like like a money making factory, like the labs, and sorry, like uh, uh, in the case of the identity, and and then they own the, the lab and they fund money, they funnel money into the lab. But you could have a lab that actually funnels money into the companies. That that was the case with the um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So in, initially, the the institute owned huge aircraft. Uh, they they owned this aircraft, the Howard Hughes uh, Aircraft Company, and they were able to use that uh, to fund themselves. Um, you could also see something like this in this company called Flagship Pioneering in the life sciences. So it was, it was the company that created Moderna, it's like an incubator of biotechs. Uh, in their case, they, they spin out their companies into the world, but you could imagine that they may also keep them uh, close to them and also in-house the, the research. Um, so in the extreme version of this, you could imagine a model where you take uh, a huge chunk of a given field and put it under the same roof and then produce the research. Uh, because after all, the, the usual reason for why the why science is the way it is, uh, the usual argument that it's like it's, it's a public good that don't acknowledge once you uh, once it's out there, everyone can use it. Well, if um, if all it takes to if to kind of get value out of that so you can feed it back into into funding the research itself is uh, is taking a field and, and making it into a company that that maybe something like that. There's this is an idea that uh, Laura Deming, uh, the the uh, VC, uh, discussed in, in a podcast uh, for I think a year or two ago, that maybe we can link to it. Uh, that was quite, quite, an, quite an interesting one. Now, on the on the incentives side, um, if you think about this, the, the, the reason, so why do scientists publish in, in journals? It's not because they, they like intrinsically, it's because they get judged on that. Um, so you could imagine, okay, then why would it take for them not to be judged on, on journals? So, and, and this, we, we, here we probably get into changing the changing uh, university policy on, on, on personal selection. So in the same way, for example, I think, um, I think the European Union and the California university system, they both decided that they were not going to fund research that would end up in, in closed journals. So they think they reached a deal with Elsevier that whenever that if they publish it in one of these journals, they would have to be uh, um, made open access after a year or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. So likewise, you could imagine that if you wanted to shift the way research gets done and evaluated, you have to begin at the university level and say, okay, we are not going to assess you on, on your on your on, on your metric counts, the number of papers, on, or or where they were published. We're just going to uh, have a committee, and then they get your papers like anonymized, I think, without the journal they, they came from, and then we're going to assess you on that. On that. You'll probably need something like that. You'll have to need like a broad that is just one university, like a broad commitment to a new form of, uh, of evaluating research that doesn't involve uh, pub like how many nature publications you have. I think. Yeah, you know, that was so interesting in my interview with Paula Stefan, right? Like she's the one who wrote the book on this. And yeah. I asked her, I said, well, what, what is your best idea to make science better? And I was surprised that she said, we should abolish college rankings. She, <laughs> she actually thought that that was the, the, the core problem, that if we could do that, there would be a bunch of important ripple effects. So um, you're in good company um, on that one. Um, one other thing that came up a little bit in Paula's book and um, I really was kind of nudging you on Twitter to write about this, is the, the role of tools, 
scientific tools and technologies. You know, there's been arguments by Freeman Dyson and others that, uh, in fact, technology is actually like the the more important driver of scientific progress than you know ideas or or paradigms. Um, yep. And yet, it's a pretty under even in the the realm of the the meta science funding uh, world, it's relatively understudied. And Paula kind of admitted admitted as such. Um, and then I've been involved in these kind of these communities of open source um, scientific equipment. You know, we were building for underwater robots, but mm. there's there's others. You see this in in biology too. Um, what's your opinion on the the role of tools, the cost of tools, and anything we can do um, on in terms of the economics of of that situation? Yeah, tooling is an is an interesting one. So uh, back in the day, there used to be this this debate between uh, whether it was um, basic research that drives innovation or whether it is the innovation that motivates doing basic research to then uh, keep going up. Of course, it, it ended up being both. Um, but I think the, this idea that that just like do basic research and then you get innovation, uh, it, uh, there's something to have, but at the same time, we need tools to do the basic research in the first place. Like you cannot do, uh, let's say high energy physics if you don't have like a large uh, particle collider and you cannot do some of these like newer studies if you don't have let, let's say newer like single cell RNA sequencing uh, um, techniques that make things uh, cheaper and, and more uh, accurate. So, so, yeah, so tools do matter and, and, and interestingly tools, um, I think relative to other things tool might, might be underfunded in that and you have like a tool, it's like, well, what, you didn't necessarily learn anything about like, uh, let's say biology, just let's say like, now now we can do, we can do newer things, but you necessarily didn't quote, discover anything, just made something available. Tools are more of an engineering problem. And I think that such are not seen as uh, interesting within academia. Um, and, but on, on, the other hand, on the other hand, I think that tools are great for the fun uh, projects approach. Uh, so it's like, a, a, I advocate for uh, in, in tool development. I think funding funding projects. So if we could say, for example, um, as one as one project with a defined uh, approach would be, uh, what would it take to to map every neuron in the brain to, to get like a full connectome? What would that take? Uh, which is actually one paper that goes into the physical limitations of this and that kind of thinking that inspired you into okay, well, maybe uh, we should advance or put money into this kind of tool and 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 maybe physics says that there's still um, a lot of improvement to make here, so let's invest in that. And those kinds of projects are well suited to the kind of initiatives that Adam Marblestone calls a focused research organization. Mm -hmm. These are like mini ARPAs or mini Manhattan projects that I aim to build uh, in a way. It's like doing, it's the, using the engineering or applied mentality for basic science tooling um, mm -hmm. to try to see, to try to produce a concrete, in this case, it's, it's not open ended at all. There's no plant club here going on. It's literally, we, mm -hmm. want, we want to make a tool that will map the brain. It will have this resolution and this cost. So the, the, the end goal is defined. It's pretty much in a dark way. Um, and once you have those tools, then you can uh, actually keep going doing the doing the research. Ultimately, I do think that the, the two key limiting factors for science, one is noisy data. Noisy data means that it's hard to know what's true or not. Uh, it's mm -hmm. hard to know where should you investigate or not. It's hard to know. Um, um, if something is actually there, as in, uh, as in if you're, let's say, in some areas of biology, if, uh, it, if you go as a scientist in there, how much can you assume, how much can you trust the literature? Famously, pharma doesn't trust academics uh, and, their, and their studies. They have, to, they, have to rep they have to replicate over and over uh, the studies that uh, academics do because they, just, they think that they aren't good enough, they are noisy. And the second hand toolings, uh, tools enable various things. Tools enable first to be able to see what was not being able to be seen in the first place. Uh, for example, there are um, optical microscopes have limits. Uh, ultimately, <laughs> the, the the wavelength of the light is what it is. Uh, but you could, for example, develop new ways of using microscopes, like uh, uh, Edwin, for example, and others developed expansion microscopy, which is to just literally to, to swell or make the sample bigger so that then you can uh, get more resolution out of the same microscope or use different or modify a sample, for example, by making it make, making it fluorescent. So you can actually see um, things that this with optical light, like you cannot see a protein just by looking at it with a regular microscope, but if, but if it's fluorescent, then maybe you can. Um, so, so again, tools make, make, make it possible to do more studies, uh, to make, make a, both because they give us new capabilities, also they enable us to uh, make things cheaper. So we can actually do more things like back in the day, uh, uh, gene editing or gene sequencing were very expensive. So it was, you have to be, um, you have to do lots of money to be able to do so now. You can even do CRISPR at home. Uh, in, in some cases, they're like these YI kits. You can, uh, it, it's very cheap now, uh, which means more studies, more hypotheses uh, to be tested. Um, yeah. yeah. 
I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's a hugely underappreciated space. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. So, you know, we were building an underwater robot in my friend's garage because we didn't, we were looking for gold in this underwater cave and it's a long story, but um, we, we built this tool for uh, orders of magnitude cheaper than was available. And we put that on Kickstarter and we raised some money. And then we presented at these, you know, leading, you know, these big scientific conferences with, you know, mm. the leading ocean scientists and ocean engineers. And they were all so surprised at we had, what we had done. And that was really surprising to me because it was so obvious. Like we were just taking the parts that were available to us and putting it together in a, in a cheap and novel way. Yeah. And so I, I almost think we, we stumbled on this kind of blind spot right? Like all these academics were so focused on the papers and going deeper that they weren't kind of thinking about like just the basic curiosity of, of enabling basic curiosity for lots of people. Um, and so this yeah, is kind um, of been a, t okay, go ahead. Oh, yes, I could comment also on, uh, because it's yeah. a similar story to, to yours, the, yeah. the story of Neuralink. So, so, so Neuralink, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, you know, like a, a BCI tool from that Elon Musk is working on, mm -hmm. but when when Neuralink came out, the, the scientists were like, "Oh, this is like old news, uh, like this, uh, this, uh, this component, like this robot and these electrodes and these sort of things." They were reading the literature and so on and so forth. So they said, "This, this is not innovative," and and I think uh, my reply is like, "These guys, the, the, the complaint about Neuralink, they're missing the point. The point is to actually take these things and integrate them into something actually useful that can act, that can then be, let's say, used uh, for in, in, in that case for uh, medical purposes." But tooling is the same. Like, uh, it's not enough to have. Uh, like a like like an academic grade assay that, that only a few people can can do. It's it's very important to take that into into the commercial stage where it can be used at scale outside of the same lab. And this was also the, the reason why so like one of the key steps in making the, this new mRNA vaccines is this procedure to actually make this uh, and lipid droplets and apparently that because it, there has been not an, enough investment in tooling that is is a it's a very uh, like like hands-on manual process that has not been automated and and this is one apparently one of the reasons why we don't have more of these uh, vaccines uh, being produced that's because we didn't hmm. invest in that kind of tooling maybe because no one thought it would be an academically in, uh, interesting problem to solve it's, it's it's more of a quote mere engineering problem is something that annoys me when someone calls something mere engineering engineering maybe mere in in that you know you can do it physics tells you that and research tells you you can do it but actually doing it is, is a, an idea is very different from the idea actually working in the real world yeah absolutely and so you know um you know speaking you know building off of that and and my experience this is that started me on a path of thinking about the blind spots of science like if no one, if we could do this in our garage and it doesn't cost us that much and it was you know this important and we could start a company and you know get this many people thinking about ocean exploration in a new way you know what other what else is in that blind spot of the the, the current um, kind of science and academic ecosystem and that has been a real interesting thread to pull on and one of the things I've, I've been thinking about especially over the past few years and this hasn't come up in your in your funding piece yet so I'd be interested to get your take on this is how concerned should we be for the foundation of science like because you know you're you're talking about the federal funding you know I just read your piece yesterday about um, federal funding and it's kind of like declining a little bit but it's not so big of a deal it's still massive compared to what it was um, you know pre World War II and and all of that um, yeah but we also just saw four years of an administration who put science on the back burner and you know there was real there's real kind of institutional decay at a lot of these agencies. Right. And so, you know, I mean, now we have a, a president of the United States where who's put science back into the into the cabinet. But how should we be thinking about these kind of bigger, broader existential risks of society? And I'll give you one more example. It's like, so we've created this vaccine in record time, and yet half the, the population in the United States probably isn't going to take it because they don't trust vaccines and they don't trust scientists. Um, how concerned, this is like a Taleb level problem, right? Like a black swan. It's like, yeah. how concerned should we, should we be? And then B, are there investments that we can make to, um, to start to fix that foundation? Um, so if, I guess like there are like various questions wrapped in this. One is about existential, existential risk um, and in general about preparation for things like pandemics. 
It's also about the linkages between science and society that um, well, ultimately science happens in a social environment and the science that gets done or not depends on what society likes. So it's like, if you, maybe if you go back even a few years ago, we had the whole um, stem cell controversy that uh, effectively, uh, so, so, to some extent, um, if, even if you, even today, if you look at uh, a lot of uh, cutting edge stem cell research, it doesn't happen in the, in the US because all the expertise was built in places like Japan or South Korea, partly because the US was not investing in, in stem cell research due to uh, political considerations, uh, I think from the, from the Bush uh, era back then. Um, on the existential risk question, the um, the I think the problem there there was an interesting one because back back then, even from for many years, the idea that there could be another pandemic w was kind of in the air, and there were even agencies and, and, and programs that were supposed to be to have some even uh, um, even a PPE uh, in, in in a storage just in case and so on. And those things were there; they were built, but apparently they were kind of abandoned. Like, oh, this thing. Well, uh, so the when Mark Andreessen published this article, it's time to build, like, oh, we're not prepared. To some extent, we were prepared. It's only that then the, we let the our preparation decay uh, um, over over time. Um, I think for independent pandemic cases, I think so. So COVID, we're now kind of climbing up, climbing up out of COVID. But there will be another one. Maybe it will be ten years, five years, twenty years. There will be another pandemic. These things are like uh, business cycles uh, in economics. These things tend to be very cyclical. And it will be very naive to think that 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 we're done. Like we have to think, okay, uh, let's assume there's a new pandemic. Now what? So the, those things should be, for example, um, um, so there should be exercises and and plans in, in place. So that, so that once the next one hits, we say, okay, uh, these are the, the vaccine distribution sites. We're going to have freezers for the vaccines. Uh, we're going to um, maybe even have like labs on, on a standby that are ready to prepare these things. In, in Spain, for example, there is this like military owned pharma lab just like to just ship out, uh, of course, without, without any uh, IP problems because it's, it's state and, and again, there's a steam roll over any IP concerns and being pharma. Mm -hmm. Just like we need, we need vaccines and we need them now, otherwise we're going to have hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people dying and we just uh, roll out those vaccines in emergency uh, uh, cases. Um, on the other end, on the, I guess you, you pointed out the, the R&D funding question. Uh, so prior to World War II, uh, the, the US government uh, was funding some amount of research. Um, he, there was, there was he dispersed across various agencies. I think I, I do have the data in, in one prior post of mine that's thing is called, uh, was World War II good for economic growth? And there's this very old um, uh, paper or for uh, 1939 or, or so that then looks back at the spending back in, in, in 38 and 37. Uh, and it was not much. Uh, so from before to after World War II, the increase in, in federal expenditure was like of, of, of around 5x. It was a huge uh, increase. That amount then increased even further during the, the Cold War and the space race, uh, uh, largely driven to like, uh, like um, Department of Energy funding atomic weapons research and NASA funding the, the space race, it, race itself. Now, there's this interesting question that we, we multiplied funding by a factor of five or more, and yet, well, GDP growth, of course, is not uh, increased by a factor of five, nor uh, anything very meaningful. There is some debate as to whether or not productivity increased during or after World War II. Uh, there, there's some arguments uh, for and, and against. I cite some work uh, in, the, in the post as to saying that it probably did not increase productivity growth. But in any case, it's, it's very puzzling that the, there seems to be an interesting decoupling between how much funding uh, we put into science uh, and then how much we, without. Naively, in, in most uh, models in economics, uh, you just put, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very very simple input output relation. You put money into research and you get productivity at the other end, but it doesn't seem to be that linear. There seems to be um, something in the, in, the, in the transmission line between uh, putting money into research and doing research and productivity that seems to be broken. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, uh, as I like to say, in, in a previous post uh, that I wrote, um, so famously, we have had this great stagnation in technology, of, not sorry, in technology in, in GDP. Uh, for since, since 1970, the productivity seems to kind of slow down and GDP growth salaries, it, the, the growth seems to slow down since then. Uh, so, it, so we may wonder, was this because technology is slowing down? Is something happened in 1970? But mm -hmm. no, technology just kept improving at the same rate. Nothing, the trends don't look anything special in 1970. So then the question is, um, what's going on there? So it might be, for example, that maybe healthcare and uh, education um, are such large sectors of, of, uh, of GDP now that the, that the fact the productivity in those increases at a slower rate uh, because they are very uh, human capital intensive. Maybe that is, is dragging down productivity, in which case we should think, okay, how do you make healthcare and education more efficient in the same way that you can make assembly lines more efficient? Um, 
and of course that's uh, kind of problematic because well healthcare it's typically a very uh, conservative slow moving sector with some uh, huge dose of uh, government regulations um, um, and in the, in the case of the US some government involvement as well as some factors that make it a very weird from a market point of view sector in that you have a uh, you have insurance, you have vaccines, you have hospitals, um, and you cannot just start a new hospital and then, and then begin trying new crazy mm -hmm. things in healthcare. That will be mm -hmm. uh, very hard to do. So yes, so that, that that's like some some answers to the to the broad question. Uh, maybe we, we can go more into into specifics if if you have more specific questions there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I kind of want to like double down on the science and society one. How worried are you about that? And is that something as you kind of look through the 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 history because I'm I've been reading a lot of you know Vannevar Bush and and you know just trying to get a sense of like what what was the attitude back then like what really was the attitude towards science because it's easy to look at it now look back and say like wow it looks like everybody was all for more science and the society was completely you know behind it and and supporting it. Um, but I don't know if that was the case. Right. And and the other thing, the other aspect of this is if, if you actually start to look at some of, there's this kind of emer emerging discipline of uh, the science of science communication. So um, we know that science communication is important. We know that, you know, I, I've seen that in the ocean space, like the impact of Jacques Cousteau on the next generation of, yeah. of scientists. We know it's important. It's actually, we, we really don't understand what we're doing there. Like we're kind of chasing YouTube views or, you know, like TV ratings, which I don't know that those are the best metrics to actually uh, measure that. Anyways, my hope is that you'll, there'll be a, a Nintel uh, series on the science of science communication uh, coming yeah, up so the, or science and society. Yeah. Where, where yeah, you stand on yeah, so actually, so this question, uh, indeed, it's it's one uh, a difficult one to to look into, and I have I have not actually looked much myself uh, in, into this one. So I guess there are like two or three sub sharp questions. If I, if I were to write about this, I would probably be thinking is like one, um, as a matter of fact, uh, there must be surveys about this. What was people's attitude uh, towards science? Uh, um, it may as well it, you know may well be that maybe they thought that that yeah, like science is great, like we're getting all all these things which really support scientists. Uh, perhaps there, there were some nationalistic undertones as in science will help us win over the Soviets back then, back then um, as in, um, um, there's also the, the question is like, how much does popular support for science matter for science? Because it I, again, it may well be that even if people don't care much about it, uh, Congress is going to fund science anyway, because some, there are some groups that do care strongly about it. Let, let's say uh, associations of, uh, of, of uh, cancer patients that those people pretty much care about, uh, like the National Cancer Institute a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists themselves, of course, care, care about science being done. And then lastly, we have the question of, uh, which is probably the hardest one, but again, we may have some evidence on this, uh, the question of, to what extent does science communication and science in general inspire the next generation of scientists? So, so for example, um, um, uh, so I, I, I think I've said once or twice that the, the Apollo program was, uh, despite not being science as such, it was the, the world's greatest arts arts project in that it, um, as a matter of like use, it, it was not uh, uh, useful in the sense that with all this money, we'd have probably gotten more quote useful things in a, in a more tangible way, but it could, it, could be that that from an inspiration point of view, the idea that that we can actually do those things, we can actually achieve such a huge feats of engineering and science, maybe that could inspire the next generation of scientists. And actually, through those effects, actually, it was worth doing uh, at least through a, from a purely uh, consequentialist uh, point of view. Now, how do we measure that? The, the inspiration and value both of large projects and also science fiction in in, in getting people more interested in in uh, and supporting of of science. Now, so this this questions have, have been kind of on the back of my head for a while, but I have not yet gone into um, into them. Um, my my well, expectation. I, I, yes. Sorry. Oh, go, no. Go. Oh, I don't want to interrupt that. Yes. 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 My expectation is that. Um, the evidence for for this, what we are the others, is going to be um, somewhat anecdotic. Uh, I think it's going to it's going to be a matter of putting various anecdotes here and there. It's going to be hard to quantify uh, to what extent it's, it is useful. But at the same time, it's, it's one where we have to be careful not to commit the, the so-called the, the parachute fallacy, which is that just because there are no randomized controlled trials of, of, of the effectiveness of parachutes when jumping out of airplanes, uh, doesn't mean that those parachutes are not effective. So likewise, just because there are no RCTs for the effect of the motivational effect of sci-fi on scientists, doesn't mean that it's not doing anything. We should be careful of not uh, unduly discounting uh, uh, such things just because there is no a strong uh, clear-cut case. 
I love it. So, well, I, I do encourage you to, to check out the, the nascent um, science of science communication work, um, because there are some folks who are trying to, like, trying to add some rigor to this. And it is, an, it's a really interesting question. It's also one that when you start digging into it, there's interesting paradoxes that come up. Um, Dan Kahn, this researcher at Yale, um, you know, found that, you know, it found some interesting results when he was looking at it's like more informed people are like giving people more facts and information is that is actually not necessarily like a good step towards changing someone's mind they're actually like more informed people are less likely mm -hmm. to change their mind mm -hmm. about climate change or something like that so there's there's some oh, really yeah, yeah. i think i remember this there there's some really it, like it, counter... it, was, it was curiosity right that that I think that was the the thing that that drives uh, people to change their minds. Curiosity, not, not merely facts, uh, being even facts. I think. Yes. So he defines scientific curiosity as something specific, like as like a, a subset of curiosity, like an interest in curiosity and in, in science. So, you know, it was curiosity, but um, and, but then you start looking in the the science of curiosity, and that is actually real, and from my opinion, like a really understudied um, uh, field. Hmm. Like the neuroscience and and you know all of it. Like I, I think the for me like that's like the the dream. Like if I had a billion dollars, what would I fund? I would really push uh, trying to get a better grasp of what curiosity actually is. Um, yeah, but, that, that's a good question because I've looked myself into creativity, but not uh, into curiosity. And there are maybe some relations there. No creativity. There's a whole like there's a a, a huge amount yeah. of literature on what creativity is, but curiosity is is um, orders of magnitude smaller. And I actually think what we're seeing, you know, from Khan's work and others is, it's potentially like a, a, a remedy to what we're seeing in, in terms of the kind of the politically biased reasoning and divisiveness. So I, I would love to see more of it. Um, hmm. Okay, well, um, do, you want, do you want to do the research mode section where we, where you tell us all your secrets to making those great posts? Yeah, we can go into that. Um, great. The open the... Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, share my screen. Uh, here. Okay. Um, uh, can you actually see this? If I deny this, I guess it works, right? Yep, it works. Yeah, that's um, great. I guess this. This. Uh, okay. This is an interesting starting point. That I, I happen to have open here. This book from Tyler Carbon, uh, the complacent class. It's a book I had read already, but I was thinking of uh, reviewing. I guess this is again go, goes to the uh, to the starting point. I think a good starting point for what I do is reading broadly, and if, even if it's not going to be directly related to um, what I'm thinking about right now, it might be in the future. So, if, for example, I, I've read these books about uh, how to systematize or think about uh, curiosity and, and uh, curiosity and, and, and designing uh, experiments on how to find interesting research problems at some point, and then that was useful later. I was also reading uh, Richard Hamming's book um, that was published with the Stripe Press, and now this one. This one, uh, there is a rationale for why this one, which is um, wait, I need to hide this thing there, uh, which is that one of the reasons that has been proposed for why there is a stagnation in GDP and productivity growth is is that maybe we're we're not trying hard enough, that maybe we are too complacent. That was a Tyler Cowen's and to some extent also Peter Thiel's uh, argument here. I wanted to see, okay. Complacency is hard to think about. So, um, what is what is exactly Cohen's argument? What evidence do we have for complacency, and to what extent is it uh, this or is it uh, something else? Because typically, my usual approach is it's to go um, in a very specific field by field dependent way and look for specific problems in specific fields, and that approach may may miss on broader cultural trends that may be affecting uh, um, many different, uh, let's say, government agencies and as well as uh, um, individual researchers. Uh, uh, in, in, as to what kind of things they, they do. Um, okay, so um, here is a, is a blog post that I wrote, the setting point for the Fund People Not Project series, uh, the HHMI and the NH, NH Directors Pioneer Award. And the title to some extent already gives away uh, what this is about. It's literally about these two uh, things. And it starts with one paper. It starts with this paper. It's a paper from Pierre Rasoulet and, and colleagues where they looked at uh, thanks. Where they looked at this uh, this particular funding project from the the HMI uh, as to where or not that was uh, um, 
a huge hit. Now, why was I why was I interested in this? Where did this came from? Well, in turn, uh, Patrick Collison um, wrote this article for the Atlantic uh, with my Michael Nielsen, where I believe it was this one, um, where they considered that like these researchers funded by HMI, they make them ninety six percent more likely to produce breakthrough work. This is a huge, if true, claim. <laughs> yeah. This is real uh, because if it is, and we can make the scale, that will be huge, right? Um, so I got interested into that paper. I think, I think what what the kind of evidence that we can use to conclude this thing. What does it look like? Um, how robust is it? Are there other points of evidence pointing in this direction? Um, so the thinking there was first to just well read the paper and, and explain. Uh, more or less to put it in, in, in some context, for example, what, what is the HMI, um, and also try to get some additional evidence. So something I like I like to do when I'm doing research is not just read the papers, but also look at Reddit threads, blogs, and in this case, Twitter. In this case, we go to Pierre Azoulay Twitter, where he said, oh, actually, um, it's not clear how we can actually scale this. And this is something that you don't get from the paper, but you, but you can, these people are, they have their own Twitters and they make this like more offhand informal remarks that maybe tell you more about what they deep down think. And we can use this to actually to actually inform or, or give some color as to what they themselves think um, we can infer from their own work. So I, that's something I like doing, uh, checking their their twitters. Um. <laughs> you know, that's that's interesting because I I, I I just wrote this post. I don't know if you saw it, but it, around science prefaces, it's like one of my favorite forms of science writing is when researchers write like a, a separate piece about why they wrote a paper, like what their motivation is and the background and all the stuff that they would never include in the paper. It's rare you see this, but whenever I find it, I always think it's such a great form of writing. So anyways. Yeah, that's, that's, that, I think I probably, uh, maybe this is also part of my process that is worth mentioning in that typically what I do through a month is to save and store various things that I come across or, people, or things that people send me. Yeah. And then wait until the end of the month and then read everything in, in bulk. I think just like go through all my Twitter favorites, I go through my RSS subscriptions and everything, the things in my uh, pocket, and then read everything and then produce my monthly links posts. And I think that way, that has two advantages. One is I don't I don't leave uh, I don't usually have a lot of tabs open in my browser. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I only have uh whatever I'm working on right now. So I just store things and then also given that it's Maybe, maybe if I find something right now, it seems interesting, I store it, but then maybe we, like with one more one month of hindsight, maybe that thing actually wasn't really that important to me. So then I just skip it. But <laughs> I, I think if, if I, yeah, it, it's still- it's Wait, still, so you only free. read, you only read once a month? Mostly, so you, you, you store mostly, yes. everything? Uh, so, with the exception of, if I'm currently working on one given project, I'm looking for a specific information for what I'm writing right now. I largely, yes, I usually push everything to one very long, maybe two days, three days long reading session, and that's usually batch everything. Um, that's more or less okay. what I do, yeah. Okay, so what's it, what would you say your cycle is then? Is it a month? Like, so you have like a month long, what's your working cycle then? Yeah, it, it's 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 uh, a month uh, that what I do. Uh, uh, I didn't necessarily, I started doing this thing years ago and I, I think a month was kind of, an, an okay thing I give me enough time because if we were like a year reading through a year a yearly backlog that would be very long but a month seems more or less doable for me um yes yeah, it's, it's basically uh I I collect everything my usual sources are Twitter I usually follow lots of uh, uh scientists and researchers and various people people on Twitter um that from various fields so they kind of get a, a very uh, media diet and then I, I save those things then I use Fitly to follow um, via RSS various blogs as well as uh, scientific journals. Journals that I get all the recent articles I've published. I save those, and also for things that I either someone sends me or things that I just come across from various sources, I use Pocket. Yes, like save the website and then I close it and then it will come back uh, at the end of the month. Then end of the month, um, I go through all of that and I read it. And if I think that, that what I just read was particularly interesting and relevant, I add it to my monthly links post. So that's that's. Mm. That's how they get made. And also in making those links posts, if I want to go back to those, um, then I can search my blog and I can, I, I can see uh, from my previous links uh, uh, what those articles were. So for example, um, let's say that I find an interesting literature review on uh, senescent cells, one of the hot topics in the area of longevity research. Maybe um, I don't read it, I don't necessarily read it, but maybe I think, well, maybe if in two months I want to revisit this topic, I know that I can search my blog for senescence and it will, it will come up and I can just use that as a, as a starting point. Um, so that's kind of pretty much my it. I mean, I 
I don't say that that I don't breed like at all whatsoever during the month. I do still breed um, during the during the month, but it's typically focused around things I'm working on uh, in the moment, like right now. Uh, for example, right now I was um, thinking about interventions in the area of longevity that may ex extend lifespan in mice. I'm just trying to compile a list of more or less a robust set of these interventions. Mm -hmm. In that case, yes, I was reading papers uh, for that particular purpose, but but when it's a matter of reading kind of in a in an unconstrained open-ended reading in a blue skies way so to speak mm -hmm. that is usually once a month and in a batched way yeah cool so on those two to three day binges are you just do you print them out or do you just read them all right here in, in pocket or something like that uh no i uh, if i had to print them i think uh, i would have like a green piece <laughs> and another ecologist <laughs> and it is going after me for for uh for killing the half of the amazon forest i <laughs> print no i I usually read them on on a laptop or in a, uh, or an iPad, depending on, on the setting. Uh, yep. I, I find this, this an interesting. I find that when you, for example, suppose that I have only like a bigger. I happen to have like a small 13 inch laptop, but you have like a bigger. I used to have like a bigger gaming laptop. Um, in that case, I cannot just like uh, be sitting, sitting on, on a sofa reading reading papers and and, and that's it. Um, because it's too heavy, it's, it's too uncomfortable. But when you have tools, in this case, either an iPad or, or a smaller laptop that allow you to just breathe more comfortably, then I found that I switched to using those, which then at the same time enabled me not, not just to read the what, what I was reading, but also as I'm reading, the reading itself may, may prompt, uh, I think like, oh, the, this thing has some interesting citations, let's also read those. Um, so as, as part of the reading process, that also leads me to other places uh, that I need to I need to have like a keyboard and, and, and an actual laptop to actually pursue. So typically I'm reading on, on a laptop. I think mm -hmm. some people argue that um, that making on a, reading on a laptop uh, gives them some eye strain or something. That I, make, I found that not to be the case. I think my eyesight seems fine and my eyes are not too dry from doing this. So, I mean, I, I enjoy reading on paper for us in some cases, but I think it's mostly fine reading on, on, on a laptop screen for, for a very, very long time. Uh, now, okay, so <laughs> that, that's awesome. So I don't want to derail you. So you were telling me about how you start to 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 organize these posts. So once you have a once you have once you find the, the question that you like that really needs to be proven out, then you start going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So in in a case, yeah, the, the driving question was this article, this big claim, um, and then I started to examine what the paper says. Um um, and where it goes. So, so actually I will be like reading the paper and I will sometimes like narrate or explain what the paper is, is saying. Um, so it's here for some, I think uh, at one point the paper might mention, uh, um, yeah, I think it was this, I think uh, this little technicality about how HHMI works. So then I, I went and gave some context about, okay, who, what kind of people are HHMI researchers? And I give some examples like Feng Zhang that worked in some CRISPR stuff. Um, I also, when, when people say, okay, well, uh, how long does HTMI in practice fund you? So then I give some concrete examples, like this, this guy, for example, David Anderson has gotten funding since even before I was born. He has had con continuous funding from HTMI for that long time um, so that readers can get an, an, an idea of in practice, what like all these abstract numbers, what do they mean in just like, in, in just like with concrete examples. Um, and then I ask um, the, and then when thinking about the concepts I'm examining, in this case, from people, not projects, that also sparked some more conceptual uh, thoughts that uh, maybe I, if back in the day, I, I used to read lots of philosophy. So that maybe had, uh, they, I, I like to think about precise distinctions and, and splitting things into, into various categories. And that got me thinking about this kind of diagram where you have, and you can find people or projects, but also you can use, let's say, interviews or a mm -hmm. more impersonal approach. And that typically we, we tend to find when you find people, you're more personal, and, you, and when you find your metrics, you're more impersonal. And it's like, okay, what would be in the other two kind of categories? And, and here we find that a personal approach for projects is DARPA, and 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 in the other category, we would have uh, things like funding lotteries or funding people equally uh, in this missing in this kind of kind of missing category. So I guess like making categories and finding what's missing in those categories is a, a way of helping about or generating mm -hmm. new ideas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, as so it happens, I'm yep. So do you, so I just kind of, I like, sorry for pushing on this, but do, are, so you start with that question, like, are you just writing this all in one kind of stream of consciousness or do you take like note, do you have like a Zettelkast in system where you take notes and you think this is interesting. I don't know where this building block is going to fit. How do you, how do you do it? Um, no, typically I, I don't 
uh, take notes, although this is pretty much context dependent. So for example, I have this uh, um, in the background because it's a question I was interested in. I have this notion um, kind of a spreadsheet kind of thing where I, for over time I have been collecting uh, papers, links and interesting things that I could use. Uh, for example, uh, how many researchers are in, uh, I think this is, this is uh, either George Church or Boy yeah, this is Boyden. So how many, how many people are there? How many people are there in, in that lab? Well, it's 60 postdocs in that case. Um, wow. also, also, how much time is actually spent on writing grants? So I looked for a bunch of papers in that space and I just compiled a piece of evidence here and there that might be interesting to use for, for writing this. But what I typically do when I approach a, a new area is, um, in this case, so if, if we take this paper, I will usually just read the paper, just like reading through it without taking notes. Why? Because when you approach a new area, you don't know what's going to be relevant. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. like when it's like being dropped in a jungle, like you don't know what's around you. You have to build a map. And I think a good way to build a map is to just take the paper, typically go and search, and you go for uh, the citations. And then here you can see look, that I already looked into this and I already looked into that. So that gets you some like the some papers that cited this that cited this paper, and then. I, for example, may open this and open this and then go to their citations and then repeat this and keep going and going and going until mm -hmm. we reach, uh, let's say this and that and this, and we end up reaching that the year 2020. Uh, so I kind of try to unfold the whole tree of citations down all the way to the present to try to see what kind of, what kind of topics and questions and concepts has this literature been uh, revolving around. Um, so I try to do that. That gives me, uh, in, I, say I, I, say I don't take notes. I just kind of build more or less a mental map of where everything is in, in this field. And then I, at that point, I start to say, okay, uh, this post is going to more or less in my head, it's going to be around this and it's going to have this section. This, this thing I typically do in bed uh, before going to sleep and just trying to write them in my head more or less as in the broader organization and maybe not a specific, a specific piece of evidence, but more or less the, the structure of, of the post. Um, and at some point where more or less everything seems to make sense, I just start to write. Um, um, of course, the, the act of writing itself is part of the, of the process in that writing, uh, some things that seem clear in my head are not so clear when I have to explain them to others. It's something I find, uh, I find writing very useful for that. And when I, and when I do that, I say like, okay, well, I, I just, I want to say this, make a disclaim, but is the evidence is strong. So then I go back to the literature to, find, to search for evidence for those claims. And I try to then, uh, um, Justify or explain to what extent we should, we have evidence for this uh, or, or that. Um, I also like as part of the writing to quote things uh, uh, because when you, when you read something, for example, when you read this blog post, um, yeah, there there is so much stuff in those in those uh, primary sources that I'm citing that doesn't make it into the post. But I think it's kind of interesting to get to be kind of like a flavor of the kind of thing that that's on which my stuff is, is built on. So I like to give these quotes to just let the or the author speak. Um, uh, from their uh, direct uh, primary evidence. Uh, so then as, as, a, as a reader, uh, this, I hope that these quotes uh, may spark some, some curiosity and going deeper um, and into clicking into, into my sources to actually seeing uh, what, what lies behind the, the, uh, the post that I'm writing. Um, I don't always do this. Uh, when there is another, so there is something uh, uh, that oh, some people know me for, this is my longevity, longevity FAQ. Uh, which is this very long uh, primer on the biology of, of aging and longevity. Um, for this one, I, I invite readers to read um, this uh, longevity FAQ making of, which is precisely an explanation of how this was built. And in this case, what I did was to build uh, another notion, a spreadsheet, uh, but in this case, um, um, with tags here by different, these are different domains within the uh, longevity space. And then I was able to then sort by year. For example, if we take immunosenescence here, we can sort by year. So then we can actually do like a chronological, um, like a um, walk through the, the field to see how it has evolved over time, step by step, and how later results been be built on top of, of older results. So then we can see kind of where, from a directional point of view, how the field is, is moving. And also, to, also to, some, to some extent to, to build some taste for, for results. So if you see one paper from 1999 claiming something, you have to guess, by the time I get to the 2020 papers, will this thing still be true? So you, mm -hmm. have to be making the, you have to be making those guesses and then to kind of train a taste for good and bad evidence and for robust or not so robust uh, results. Um, so here do you use, uh, do you use yeah. Cite as all? Do you, have you tried using Cite at all? Cite.ai? Yeah. Yeah, so I've used it uh, 
Um, more recently, I think I've used it for in a very kind of tactical way for some papers. Uh, um, the first time I came across a site um, is uh, I was like, oh, it's it's kind of the idea is great, uh, but it, it was like it was not it was not fully there. So, um, now it's it's getting better. I don't use it as a matter of course, like over and over, but I think I do remember uh, for the original paper, the, the Azulay paper, like putting this on site. Maybe I don't know if we can uh, do a quick site uh, website site. Uh, AI. You can do a quick demo of site. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so site is useful both for seeing supporting evidence and a neutral evidence. And even, even if it's not like hundred percent accurate, it can mm -hmm. still get you, um, for example, this paper, I don't know if I would have found this paper uh, if not for um, for site. Um, it's it's a difficult thing that they're trying to, they're trying to quantify if a paper is supporting or uh, disconfirming some prior evidence. Um, mm -hmm. I love um, it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea. Like I think that uh, going back to the tools section, uh, um, I was talking about tools to do research, but uh, from a meta science point of view, tools to actually surface and, and be able to, to, to localize and find uh, research that you may care about is, is very important. I, I was talking to, I've been talking to, to scientists uh, as part of my, my uh, blog, blog writing and asking them, uh, well, uh, um, do you like read obscure uh, papers in obscure Russian journals uh, that look very shady? You know, when you Google a scholar, like when you go here and you, and you click here uh, and you go to the, like to way back, uh, uh, you know, let's, there are sometimes this video of obscure, like this stuff, it's like, do you read this stuff? Uh, probably not. Uh, well, it's because it's because it's in Russian. But you know, like at the end of the, it's not, it's, it's look very shady. But um, who is even this person? Uh, uh, Elena Skupitera. Yeah. So, um, so I think that there is probably lots of work that might be relevant to a given researcher. But because it's in a different field, it's in a different journal, you don't know uh, what what the good labs are. You don't know what the good journals are. You don't know what the good evidence looks like. But if we had something a bit more automated, then it makes it easier for you to say, okay, well, let's do like a quick dive into this field and you can trust uh, tools like sites to actually let me what's good uh, and what's not. And hopefully through that, we, we can get more like interdisciplinary work uh, going on. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Well, I derailed you. You were you were showing me your notion board. I don't want to go, I want yes, to go back yes, to that because yes. you were just telling, notion. telling me something. Yeah. Yes, so, so uh, notion, so I, um, so Notion was kind of like a personal randomized control trial of sorts. I typically wouldn't use Notion, but then say, okay, uh, let's let's say uh, one day I decide arbitrarily let's use Notion for the next post, and it which happened to be the longevity FAQ. Um, so I decided, I decided to uh, just like compile all these papers here again. I I started with this paper that's called the Hallmarks of Aging, uh, just around there uh, somewhere. Uh, well, maybe not. Must be, we may have some filter in there. Oh yeah, I do. Uh, oh, that's why. Yeah, there are even more papers in there. There are like 193 apparently that I've seen. Uh, yeah, so this this paper, and then it was a similar um, game. I think the, the way this came to be is, is like, I was I, I took the paper um, and then I would uh, look for citations or paper, uh, citations uh, that, pay, that that either cited the paper or the paper cited and then put those in a Google Doc. Uh, and then as I was reading them, I would put them in Notion, then take them out. It, it's, it's like a stack that, that keeps growing um, mm -hmm. because I, I keep like copy pasting links and interesting things into, into the Google Doc. And then I keep reading and deleting and putting into Notion. Uh, so this is this balance between uh, adding interesting things and, and reading and putting into Notion. And at some point when I feel like what I'm reading gets repetitive. It means that I'm more or less getting a good view of the field that I'm not being surprised anymore. Um, and then I usually as a stat, I, so I stop just adding new things to the stack. I finish the stack, everything is in Notion and I can start uh, reading them again uh, uh, more closely. Um, in, so Notion itself, what I typically have here is not, uh, so the notes I take uh, sometimes I typically just literally copy paste the paragraphs from the paper itself that give more or less an idea of what the paper is about as well as interesting pictures and, and diagrams and figures from the from the paper. Um, so then by co copying the interesting bits, I can then, let's say, do, do a search for, let's say, thymus. And I, get, I can do full text search on all these papers um, and then see exactly what they're like, say the papers about the, the, the thymus. And this is get every initial. There is, for example, this book about the history of fishes. It's like, why is this here? Um, well, this is here because I found one claim in one paper that said that um, 
most uh, this this uh, uh, most uh, animals have, we have this gland called the thymus, and the, the thymus shrinks as we age. And, and, they, and when they say most, they mention an exception. But where this is exception came from? So then we go to this uh, uh, book that then references all their papers. Um, um, and then I went down this rabbit hole of uh, of uh, citations leading up to some very old German work from the 30s or so, uh, uh, which didn't end up leading anywhere, as in other than. I think it was, uh, oh yes, here it is. On the other hand, in primitive sharks like a herodontus, there is no involution of the thymus associated with age, found in 1987. So if you read this guy, then he, this guy is also citing it, some prior work and you keep going back, which is, goes to say that when you find claims that are interesting, sometimes it's worth seeing that maybe that, that claim is supported by a single study that was done way back and no one has replicated and maybe, maybe the claim seems robust because everyone is making the claim, but actually maybe it's not so robust, maybe, Everyone is just repeating what everyone else is saying. Um, yes, yeah, so notion um, for in this case longevity, uh, but as I say, I don't, do, I don't always do it. Um, I think notion is it pays or it's, it's better when you are going to a field that's completely new that you don't know really much about it. Um, yeah. And you want to really keep track of lots of different threads at once. Um, so because so then, for example, when I was writing the FAQ and I had this, I could say, okay, um, um, I want to uh, I want to filter by immunosenescence, and then just look at this topic, and then different topic, and then different topic, instead of reading all over the place because uh, my memory, my working memory doesn't like can I cannot hold everything at once uh, in one so go. So these are like functionally your notes, but they're more like re reference points, right? Like, so you're not, you're, you're going, yeah. you're going yeah. from like, you're just organizing the papers almost in like a map, you know, in your head, but also a map here on Notion, like, like a, like a graph and, but there's no yeah. notes. You just, you just go right into um, kind of drafting us this up on your, on like WordPress or whatever you're using. That's why you, that's where you... it's like the, the, the broad, the, the way it feels like uh, subjectively is that, uh, yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if when, when you, when sometimes when you load an image uh, online, the mm -hmm. image looks very blurry at first, it's, it's very grainy. Mm -hmm. And then it slowly, when it, when it, as it loads, it becomes clear. Um, that is one approach uh, in which you try to kind of get a high level view of a field um, and then go uh, slowly increase the resolution more or less uh, evenly, or you could just pick a slice, a very a small part of the field and go very deep to understand that and then and then do that and then probe in, here and there. And, and, and the, I like to- The mind sweeper approach. Yeah, exactly like, like yeah. a <laughs> approach, yes, yes. So I, I like to build the, the map first, um, uh, this paper, the hallmarks of aging as we are here. And suppose, I used to think the first paper I read in longevity, uh, so, Read this paper, okay. So then we reach this thing that's something that's called uh, H4K16AC, histone modifications. Now, should you go down and read lots of papers and watch conferences on, uh, on HK4116AC? Maybe yes, maybe not, who knows? You don't know, of course, because uh, at first you're reading this, you're reading this to build uh, to build a map. So you don't know, you know what matters, you have to read through it and and you just take note that you saw this thing called H4K16, I see that's in the, in the back of my mind, just remembering all these little keywords or HP1 alpha. Uh, I have actually, even to this day, I have no idea what HP1 alpha is. I, so now I know what these things are, but back then I didn't really pay much attention to them. Now, uh, when you read this paper and then you follow some citations here and there, you will, some words or uh, topics, topics and concepts, will you will see them more often, which means that uh, maybe they are probably more important. So if you keep seeing uh, HK for 20 ME3, maybe this, there's something to that thing. Maybe that thing sits at an, at, at an nexus of various uh, other papers and concepts. So maybe you, you should actually understand what that is uh, at the end of the day. Um, but you, you, would, you would not be able to know this uh, upfront. You have to actually just wait and see where the literature is going to take you. Uh, so whereas if, if you try to take notes uh, and try to understand everything as you go, Mm -hmm. You may end up in rabbit holes you don't really want to go to. That things mm -hmm. that are, are too niche to your interests. Mm -hmm. um, so paradoxically, I think that the um, the kind of work or environment where it's best to take notes is work that you're already familiar with because you already know what what's important and what to take notes about. So when you're attending, let's say, a conference uh, in your field or something to really know about, or when you're reading work that also really more or less. Uh, 
within your areas of expertise, then it makes more sense to diagnose because you mm -hmm. have a frame of reference from which to assess uh, what's relevant. But when going into new fields, uh, then it's like, who knows? So, so yeah, that's, that's, more, that's mostly why I take yeah. notes. Yeah. I, I, it's really interesting. Um, I have kind of like a bigger question for you. This is kind of like not specific. Yeah. I know, I know you've like worked at Twitter and I, I've read all your posts, but I don't actually know. Do you have a background in science? Like, did you study science? Yeah, so my, my formal background is in, so my, I have a, two master's degrees uh, and some okay. more bachelor degree. The bachelor degree is in, in the literal translation from Spanish should be industrial engineering. Okay. But it, it, it's a very weird degree. So we, we, are, we are taught thermodynamics and fluid mechanics, uh, finance, accounting, uh, human resource management, project management, mm -hmm. uh, um, like um, electronic integrated circuit design. Uh, we also got to do some work with ROS. It's like a robot uh, operating system thing. Mm -hmm. and, and then I did a master's in something similar to that. And then I did a master's in, in um, aerodynamics and control theory. So my, in this case, my master thesis was on, on hypersonics. Now, while I was working at my, doing my bachelor's degree, I, I did do some good science in that I did publish a paper on, on, uh, on this area called, that, that's called multi-body dynamics. Uh, uh, Multi-bodies being systems made up of multiple bodies uh, that can be like, solid bodies or, or, or rigid, rigid or, or flexible. And we use this to, to develop new algorithms to simulate things like, like cars or like my Mars rovers, incidentally. We're using these to simulate um, when you apply some forces to the vehicle, how does it behave, um, kind of thing. So in, in that sense, I, I, I did some science myself during, uh, during one year. That science got published and I went through the whole uh, publication process, journal referring back and forth. I have done some peer reviewing for, uh, for some journals in, in, the, in the area where I published. Um, but that's where my formal exp experience with, with science itself uh, ends. Uh, do, you, yeah. do you consider yourself a scientist? Like if someone asked you, are you a scientist, what would you say? Oh, that's a good question. I think, uh, uh, which, which uh, maybe I will, I, will, I will give the general answer to, to, to that question. Do I make, a, which is, do I consider myself to be X for a given X? And I don't find it easy to answer such questions because I'm, I'm uh, the question of uh, self-identity is, is one that that I always struggle with, like, what am I? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Am I? Uh, yeah. Am I? I know. Am I an economist? Am I doing sociology of science? Am I? I mean, I like to introduce myself as an independent researcher, um, mm -hmm. which is more or less what gets an idea of uh, the sort of thing I'm, I'm doing. Um, I'm doing. Uh, There's science. more and more of yeah. that, don't you think? Like, I, I maybe it's just a uh, something you know it's a rabbit hole that I've been going down, but there's more and more people who are kind of identifying in this realm. Would you, would you agree? Uh, yes, there is more of that uh, online. Um, there's, for example, my friend, Alexei Guzzi that has been publishing also on, on science of science and, and, and life sciences. Uh, he's also doing something of that. Um, there, there's, there's, there's some interesting comments uh, on this. I remember from this guy, uh, Venkatesh Rao on independent research that there are various flavors of independent research. There is, um, there are various levels. First, you maybe you just summarize research that has been there. Then you critically assess and find flaws in research, and maybe, then you can like contribute uh, and do or, like, some original work. Uh, now, my take has my take has typically been that there is a lot of data and, and work al already out there, um, and that and that it really pays to kind of summarize and then take a body of work and say we know this and we do not know that, and this is the all mm -hmm. things considered view. Um, which to me, it's something different from doing literature reviews. Literature reviews, to some extent, are to just just, just try to cite everything, um, and you, sometimes you need literally everything to to make a point uh, that, that they're making, and they sometimes tend to be extremely narrow. Um, sometimes you want to say something about a broad question, or sometimes you want to be even narrower than them. For example, here one question I addressed. Uh, let me find. Uh, oops. Um, this this is a question that uh, that is not answered in, in scientific literature, but that I answered. Uh, uh, which is, can you reverse cellular senescence? Cellular senescence, they're like, they are these cells that uh, that have the, have short telomeres typically, or, or they are damaged in other ways, and that they typically uh, emit this. Uh, they have this inflammatory phenotype whereby they they uh, generate inflammation, and can uh, and and if you clear these cells, you can basically get uh, more health span and lifespan in in, in various uh, animal trials. So, well, people will say that that these cells, when our cells become senescent, there is no way. It's an irreversible it's a cycle of arrest. That there is no way to irreversible like, arrest growth. That there is no way to an instant. Now, is this true? Well, the answer is no. It's not true. Uh, and I point to a bunch of experiments that show that this is not true. And I point and then I assess to what extent 
these papers are actually robust, to what extent, uh, I believe it's a small framework to say, were they really senescent? What did they do? What did they observe? I think other interesting findings. Um, what is the risk that finding is not true? And uh, what is the all things considered assessment of this paper? And then I move to a different paper. And again, what were they really senescent? What was the intervention? What was observed? So I apply the same framework to these papers to, to then come up to an all things considered uh, perspective on, 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 on that. Um, so yeah, um, and then in parallel, this, th th there are some things that are, are, that I'm doing that are not public yet uh, that involve finding bottlenecks and um, in various in various fields, uh, which involves talking to scientists, figuring out what's interesting uh, or or problematic in, in their fields, and then making those into projects and trying to actually come up with uh, new uh, studies of my own. And that's not public yet. I hope that it will be uh, public at some point. But a lot of my time is, is going into into that uh, these days. Mm, cool. What's the future of independent research? Is it just emergent uh, emergent ventures grants plus eventually a Patreon? <laughs> eventually a Patreon? Um, it's a tough one. Um, so first, because the 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 kind of person that it takes to do this, uh, it's it's a very weird person. Uh, see, um, uh, a bunch of times I have been asked, "Why?" It's like Jose, why do you what do you even do all of that? Uh, why do you even care about all of this and, and just trying to be fair and assess things? Like you're you're not going to get that tenure anywhere. Why do you even care? Um, the kind of person that that cares about all these things and not only cares but is willing to just throw lots of time at doing this, is rare. I was thinking of, of writing this, this uh, handbook or manual of how to write blog post like Nintil, kind of like giving away my secret sauce. But the thing is that even with the secret sauce, the, the frameworks and things I used to think about versus topics, you still need to put a lot of time into actually doing the doing the blog posts. So it's not like there are more people are going to jump into this. Um, and now I, I'm, I'm more or less able to work on this full time. But prior to that, it was like, it, it really consumed a huge chunk of my spare time just doing all this work. And those of people are not willing to just sacrifice uh, the, the, their personal lives on, on, on to be able to do research. Um, that's a matter of personal preference. Um, that's of course like I'm not going to, to push anyone. They're like you should totally do this thing and like um, instead of becoming like like a like a sourdough connoisseur instead of that you could you could you know instead you could do research. But uh, if you're doing sourdough is fine. Um, it, it doesn't have to be all of us. Um, I think the the biggest issue is that. Um, you can do some independent research and some stuff on your own part time, but then if you want to scale and do it full time, as in, uh, as in you can donate money to someone that is part time, but that money, th those money donations typically until they can support themselves full time, it's not going to improve, increase the output. So right now I was able to double my output just because I can do twice the, the, the amount of time. But before, um, if, 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 like, if like, let's say if, if you give me like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars every month, that's not going to make me quit my job to write more. Uh, it would mm -hmm. be enough to make up for the uh, for my day job. Um, there is also some uh, some other difficulties with independent research. For example, I wanted to get at some point some data to replicate one study uh, in this in this field. Uh, uh, we should also apply for this. This is in called Punitive Clocks, um, and. I tried to get some data from NIH to replicate some study, but NIH won't give the data to you unless you're an academic from an actual institution, which is like, well, I cannot get the data. Um, uh, a problem with independent research as well is that people won't take you seriously. Is that when when being in conference calls, uh, people will introduce themselves are like, oh, I, I'm this person uh, at Harvard with a PhD from Yale, and I'm working on this. And I'm like, hey, I'm Jose. I'm 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 Jose. Yes, nice to meet you. I have I have no. Uh, and yeah, the like affiliation, like, yeah, yeah, affiliation, yes, yes. Um, so I think that maybe uh, some things some people do is that there's there are these uh, entities like Igdor that mm -hmm. um, they are like you can affiliate yep. yourself to those, or I think another one is called uh, the Ronin Institute, that, yes, yeah. uh, so that you can get some affiliation for, for those, but. Uh, still, it looks pretty awkward. Like you show up in these uh, in these meetings uh, with various uh, professors, and it's like I'm a running scholar. It's like what is running thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it's but it, it's uh, but it, don't they also fun. do fiscal sponsorship so that you can actually run grants through them too? Because that's a problem I, I've I've know that people have had if leaving think, academia. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you could get the grants because I think indeed, indeed some grants they will only give the grants to the institution and then not to yourself directly. That's that's true mm -hmm. in the. Um, I was more thinking, uh, assuming you, you have, assuming you, you can get funding, uh, assuming you you can actually work full time on this, how do you get the access to like how do how it's like how ultimately how will you be taken seriously? 
because mm -hmm. uh, um, there are some there are some interesting things happening in fields that you only get to by like kind of back channels by talking by by, by a private emails, private Slack groups, uh, seminars that are online. And you cannot immediately get into those from the outside, and you cannot you can only read the papers and what is publicly available, but only when you, you when you become quote one of them, will will you get access to all the all the inner kind of juicy let's say Q and A's with the researchers about the actual mm -hmm. substance of the papers and mm -hmm. from the outside. And I guess one is missing out on on some of this like um, uh, kind of the the private life of, of of science. The private life of science. I love that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to show me um, on on your about your process? Um, um, Any other there, tricks or tools or so anything we have like that? Notion. Yeah, I mean, maybe so. There's this on my personal GitHub. There's this thing that I recommend reading. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, not not Nintil. That's 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 on Open Nintil, um, which is GitHub. The, uh, uh, on, on yeah. this little um, thing here called the Nintel Rules of Research, which was meant to be from uh, two years ago now. Um, a, a brief expl explainer of how I do what I do, which is like one wants to know is X such that at the time of finishing the research, uh, there is yeah, fully read everything that you need to know, what should you do? That's not the, the motivating question. Of course, this is, I, I repeatedly fail at doing this, because I still get things wrong. Um, but I hear I more or less go over some of the, the themes uh, I already mentioned about, well, how to, this is, this, is, this is very vague. I hope to be able to, uh, uh, oh, this is also an interesting one, the YOLO, which basically saying that uh, some, some heuristics just kind of accelerate uh, how fast you learn something. Um, oh, I just got something I wanted to mention as well. In all of my posts, there is this thing called, is article wrong? You click mm -hmm. here. There's this thing I do where when I publish something, if what I publish is wrong, I pay for mistakes, which is a good incentive to both keep myself accountable, to, mm. to not bullshit my readers, and also to keep things current. So in the longevity FAQ, for example, um, there is this change log at the bottom um, where I've been publishing the updates, what, what I change every day. Um, and some of these... Uh, it came to me because of, of my mistakes. I also have this uh, mistakes section here where I, whenever I make a mistake, I say who who noticed the mistake, how much money they got. For example, here, Lord Deming uh, got $60 for some mistakes I made. And I say what the mistakes were, what the post was. More recently, this guy called $50, uh, this random person called Lord Royal from Reddit. Um, <laughs> some mistakes I made in, in, a, in an old post that I wrote. So, uh, so yeah, I think that this is something that most people don't do, of course. Um, it's something I mentioned here that Donald Knuth does this, this uh, CS researcher, okay. um, as well as uh, I think there was a, a the Daniel Lackens. I think he was, uh, I think uh, uh, Lackens, uh, he was, or he was doing something, uh, red team. He was doing something like that. There was some initiative going on here where they would pay for mistakes found uh, yes, I think that. Uh, oh no, this was like funding a team to find mis find mistakes in in in, in some work. Hmm. But yeah, I think I find this very valuable. That 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 first, maybe even from some um, identity point of view, like being the kind of person that is willing to stake some money on, on claims, I something I like is saying is saying not not only I want to to seem uh, to be correct uh, because of course most people won't click all my links and references and see we, uh, what I'm saying. But I actually want, as a matter of fact, to be correct. As, as in, uh, as in, uh, I don't want it to be the case that, to be the case that when I say something, then that something turns out to be actually be not true. Um, I say, of course, I am wrong um, often. I just try to just uh, be open-minded and then correct uh, what I say. Mm -hmm. And this is, is one more device and mechanism to keep me uh, uh, honest. Um, and uh, sadly, to some extent, sadly, uh, not a lot of a lot of people send me mistakes th through this. Uh, so it's not like I'm just like losing lots of money through being wrong all the time, and mm -hmm. I'm and I and there's probably lots of mistakes that are out there that I don't notice that I actually fix before someone notices and I have to pay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think this is something that uh, I think about sometimes. Uh, what can we do to actually keep ourselves more more honest? Uh, this idea of of making little I also have this little bets section here. Um, for example, I I think that that pollution is bad for uh, for cognitive function. And Alex Aguzzi thinks that, that that is not. 
Uh, so we in, so here we uh, we said okay let's make a bet Let, let's see who's right and I think the fact that you have to make a bet uh, here and here and now forces you to confront your beliefs it's like do I really believe in this do I, is it my my belief is so strong that I'm willing to put some money on the line um, for this um, and that helps you think more clearly about what it is that you actually think I think this is, maybe this is a kind, kind of on, on a meta point there is a difference between what you think you think and what you actually think uh, which is why writing is so interesting is that when you write when you commit to writing and to try to explain something, you realize that what seemed clear initially was not so clear after all. And bets mm -hmm. and writing help with uh, with clarifying thought. Yeah, you know, the long now does the long bets, which yeah, a bunch yeah. of them actually came due this year. And um, I thought it was interesting. It's, it's, uh, it seems to be, okay, here, there, here, there. Yeah. yeah. You know, a bunch of them just came due in 2020. <laughs> and, uh, it was uh, it was pretty interesting because you know like like you said like it, the the questions turned out to be like kind of more complicated than than they thought in a lot of cases. So, anyways, I agree. I think it's it's funny because yeah. you you're trying to add more clarity to something, but you end up kind of exposing all of the nuance. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about um, I think it's called I have this document that's called an OS for science. Uh, mm. uh, I don't know if. Uh, I can find something. But the issue is that suppose that 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 next time you read a paper, the paper like each sentence in the paper has a different color, and that color is related to how how strong the claim is. And in turn, um, so suppose that the the paper says um, um, the HHMI funded researchers are twenty percent more um, um, uh, effective. At, uh, so, uh, as measured by some metric in uh, you know, doing science. As you look at that claim, you could see. First, where the claim came from, uh, when the when the um, and you could see maybe related claims. Uh, so, sorry, as in uh, if there are like ten papers that are relevant to one claim, mm -hmm. uh, and all ten mm -hmm. papers give give or or, or or increase or reduce the weight on that claim, then you could mm. you could kind of you could kind of tie each claim to the to the sources, so that when reading something, it, it's not every sentence is, is not as strong as every as every other sentence, and so you could kind of see um, how like a weighted um, confidence. Yeah, and, and and also so so if you read let's say if you write an article now maybe everything would look green because you have tried to find good evidence for things but maybe five years on the road when you read the essay again because these citations are dynamic linked to some database maybe now the essay has some some red and orange uh, sentences meaning that the things that you that we said were true now they are not so now you can see that those some of those claims they are not quite true anymore um, mm -hmm. which would which would help keep things uh, current um, instead of having to guess, okay, this thing, this article from about the minimum wage five years ago, is this still true? Maybe it's not. Maybe things mm -hmm. have changed now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something I've been thinking about, uh, but I, I like don't know it. how to make it uh, workable. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting idea, nonetheless. I'm so en enthusiastic about all of the work I see happening around um, reimagining the scientific paper and uh, just kind of, to, you know, tools for thought. And I, I just, I, it feels like a, a really um, vibrant uh, group of folks who are working on a bunch of just different interesting ideas. And I think we're going to have something different in the next five years. I, I really do think things are going to change. But yeah, you know. I think interesting with, uh, with uh, tools for thought, I think it's, they are in some regard, like self-driving cars in that, uh, in that um, it's not enough for them to be 90% good. Um, they have to be, because uh, they have to be 99.99% uh, good because if not, then you're not going to use them. I think if, if it's, if it, if it does, it feels like, like a drag on your productivity. If it's like, if it's almost good, there's like uncanny valley in between where you're like, ah, if uh, it's, it's kind of almost there, but it's but not there. So you, you end up falling back to your manual methods. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, for, for example, um, if there were a tool that, that's going to find you relevant papers. If it's like if it's only like seventy percent good, maybe you're not really going to be using it because you can manually do it better than the tool. Um, or, or for example, suppose that uh, so Andy Matushek has been working on this um, space repetition system called Orbit mm -hmm. that enables you to embed uh, prompts uh, in articles so then so that, you, so that your readers can um, more easily remember what your article was about. Mm -hmm. But and. But then, for to to um, the problem is that as an author, you have to force yourself to actually include those prompts. Mm -hmm. um, but then, suppose that you have, we had some maybe some GPT three based system that automatically 
uh, suggests uh, interesting flashcards to embed in your text. And you can like, as an mm -hmm. author, all you need to do is to either say, so let's say the system generates 20, and then you can say, you can reject or accept uh, generated cards, and then you can maybe just cor correct or edit them. And then just like, yes, no, yes, no, I want this one, not this one. That way will make it will be, will make it more seamless uh, to actually uh, build all of this knowledge onto the paper. Likewise, you could imagine that it will be very useful to for papers to be not just a paper, but also some kind of metadata file which um, claims the paper is making and maybe some confidence uh, or, or maybe some diagram as to how all the different assets and pieces of evidence in the paper converge into the results on the claims the paper is making. And suppose we had some system to, like GPT-3 or something like that that could infer from the written paper the that metadata, and then and then the author just into to to uh, tweak and change the little errors, and 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 it's good to go instead of having mm -hmm. to write it from scratch. Uh, yeah, I think that reducing friction is uh, an undervalued thing. Uh, I think famously. A lot of these like startups, uh, Silicon Valley startups, they, they they seem stupid at first. Um, like if you take a Stripe, a Stripe is quite silly in that in that like of course we have PayPal and, and we, we could pay online before and like and, and we have Visa and Mastercard. Why do we need a startup to do this? Well, it turns out that it was not as straightforward as, as, as we thought. And and when you make it as straightforward, you get more payments, more commerce, and more mm -hmm. more stuff happening than you would always get. And the same thing is true for tools for thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Okay, well, if you want to stop sharing, I have one last question for you. And um, okay, that yeah. is, I should be able to. Um, the, the one I ask everyone at the end, and, and you've answered it in a lot of different ways, so you can pass if you want, but what are, what, what's your best idea to make science better? If, you, if we think about the, the long list of ideas, what, what's the one thing you would do tomorrow that would improve it? Mm. I mean, there, there is the one answer, which is the, the cheating answer, and then maybe there is a real answer. The, the cheating answer is, uh, although it, it doesn't get, get stated enough, so maybe I'm, I'm cheating that much, which is we need more experiments. Yeah, we need, we need uh, to, to try more things. Uh, so in particular, what I would do is to take, um, next time there is a call for, we need more funding in science, we need, more, we need half a billion more in science. That money should be allocated in, in 20 different ways. They should be given to 20 different people with independence from each other. And then each of them should have independence to devise their own uh, funding schemes. Now I, ha I have my own, I, I described earlier, one potential funding scheme that one could follow from, from a, a bunch of money. Um, um, but uh, this should be one idea. Now, uh, uh, saying that we should do more experiments is, is kind of like, a, it's cheating in that I'm not really committing to, to something in particular, but something that I do think, but I have not mentioned yet that I think is very valuable is this idea of, of, of engaging in scientific bottleneck finding and roadmap analysis is to say science to some extent sometimes looks like a uh, stamp collecting in that we have all these different facts here and there and we have all these different theories but sometimes we lack a view of where we stand and where we're going as, as a field um, for all different fields so in semiconductors the industry has this roadmap that says okay we are we are we can make chips that are like 10 nanometers and then five nanometers in, in three years and one nanometer in 10 years. And this, these are more or less the hot areas and this is more or less the avenues that are going to get us to the next um, node uh, in, in, in chips uh, in feature size. And so suppose that you had like a roadmap for let's say um, 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 aging. So you, you would have um, a website, let's say, and again, it's for each field, a website that, that says, here is the field. Here are all the areas in the field. Here are the researchers, the labs, and here are the current the current bottlenecks. Like the field, let's say, com is complaining about the lack of uh, um, old di genetically diverse mice to do experiments on. We need more of that. The field complains about the lack of uh, a cheap um, assays for a specific kind of uh, of, uh, of question in, in the field. The field needs uh, this and that. And also the field sees this and, and, and those areas as, as potential uh, interesting avenues to get to kind of the next uh, agreed set of goals uh, in the field, which might be, let's say, to uh, make, ma make mouse lives uh, live, let's say, 70% more or something, something like that. Um, and by doing this, hopefully we will get uh, both from the scientists themselves more of a view kind of be, for them to be able to, to step back and see where they stand in, in the whole of the field so they can maybe take more informed decisions as to where they want to take the research next. Second, uh, th this is the, the, the least interesting because scientists already know to some extent what's, what's going on in their field. After all, they are in there. 
but for policy makers, uh, philanthropists, and for people that are outside of the field to be able to, to make it more visible to the outside, I think that would mm -hmm. be extremely valuable. Say, I think, suppose mm -hmm. you're Bill Gates um, or Jeff Bezos and, and you want to say, okay, um, I want to do some initiative to, to, to fund some research. What well, does the field as a whole thing would be worthwhile? And you would have to build it from scratch um, every time um, mm -hmm. if we don't have uh, this like a network uh, of roadmaps and bottlenecks uh, for everyone uh, to, to see. And that should be visible and 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 updated and and I love yeah. that idea. Yeah, I think, I think so. that's a really cool idea. Yeah, I think this would be interesting if, if we had like funding to like an institute for like scientific road mapping or about like finding something with that name and having that producing roadmaps for various fields, that would be uh, very, very uh, appealing. If it's something that has not been done in a general way, except maybe piecemeal here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that is not going to necessarily happen on its own. So it's, it's a good target for like a new innovation thing. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 uh, and, and you could potentially see what, what's the effect of uh, when you take a field or you could do, to go back to this experimentation theme, you could say, okay, mm -hmm. uh, as a funder, uh, I'm going to pick uh, 10 fields uh, at random and 10 other fields, and then and then see if you if you create roadmaps in these 10 fields, what happens to funding citations and 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 so on? Do creating these roadmaps affect science itself? And you could do this little mm -hmm. experiment to see if this thing actually um, does anything uh, to the fields of interest. I love that. It's like a because I mean you wouldn't start a like a construction project or like a, you know, like a software development project without that kind of Gantt chart roadmap, like really understanding where your bottlenecks are, you just wouldn't do yeah. it. So yeah, why I don't think, we approach a, a, a discipline like that? Yeah, I think science scientists might be somewhat averse or, or, or perhaps they, because we were talking about uh, before about uh, funding people and, and blue skies research. Initially, mm -hmm. it may seem strange because science is to some extent open-ended and, and perhaps to the extent that it is not, it's more engineering than science, but if you think of science as like going to into the jungle to search for an Eldorado or something like that, mm -hmm. um, sure, you don't know where it is, but 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 you have like more or less a map of the of your surroundings. Then you also have like um, like a sketchy and reports from from the natives about like like we have seen this here and this in there. So so it's 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 not like the the field and the, the structure of the field lacks the structure at all. It's that it's that there is like a core of more or less a solid evidence, and then there are like progressively more. Um, speculative things uh, and, and directions uh, uh, that you may take as in sure you may be doing blue skies research but the avenues that you can take from a given point in knowledge are to some extent what they are at a given point in time and, mm -hmm. and if you have a new one you can of course go to this website and add your hey uh, i think that um, liquid liquid phase separation or some uh, an rna condensates are relevant for aging so i'm going to add this to the roadmap and then you get you make that of that uh, obscure thing, and now it's it's visible for everyone to see mm -hmm. that hey, there, there's a new uh, new thing in, in, in a new path that you could explore. That uh, if we had this roadmap, you could just like log in into your field dashboard, and you could see oh, uh, we have a new thing here, a new interesting avenue that is now relevant. That maybe you have some some informal or formal Wikipedia style process where, where just mm -hmm. researchers could curate um, what goes or doesn't go into the roadmap, uh, or you could have workshops yeah. periodically to update it. Yeah, so many different things here that we could go <laughs> or. Mm -hmm. I, I like it. Well, um, I, I think it's a great idea, and um, uh, hopefully we'll we'll put it out there and and people will start take it seriously and fund it. I love the idea. So yeah. I've really enjoyed this. This was uh, more fun. I thought it was going to be really fun. It was more fun. I learned a yeah. ton. Uh, thanks for your really time, fun, yes. and uh, hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, goodbye. See ya.